Check it, check it, check it. This is Unique Hustle. It's your boy, E.C.O. And we're with Columbia Amazing. Mr. Mako, what's going on? Not nothing, you know, my damn low part. Man, hey, man. This is the day that the God has made our choice and be glad in it, man. We got a blessing, man. This guy here, man, I didn't see him. I wouldn't try to research it, man. He eats something else. That's all I'm going to tell you. I got in for a treat today. This Kurtz Kurt is in this building, man. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Man, man. Yeah. This, this, this one right here been... Boy, this this her interview. Uh, <laughs> is this woman your? Yeah, she's my wife. Oh, okay, this your wife. But woman. she's been she's been man, she's been pressing the button to get you in here. Her and that what was that girl named Jada? Jada, Jada Arnay. Jada Arnay. Arnay. She's she's right. she, that that's mic's still girl. smoking ever since she left. Boy, she ain't playing with that mic. Mm-hmm. That is, she is absolutely amazing. Amazing. Yeah, she's amazing. That's my girl. Yeah, you you got a lot of girls. I, I just seen you. I, I I mean, I I seen you with. Erica, I seen you with different people down there. Oh, you know. What, what? But a funny thing going on. Know. But a funny thing is that when we um, first, because I've been to um, the Black, Black Academy, Academy, right? Because we went for plays and different things mm-hmm. before. Um, but I didn't know about you. We just went just for the activities. But we were on live one day, and people were in our comments. You should get Mr. Curtis King on your show. You should get Mr. That's what made me reach out to you at first. Okay. Is because um, people were requesting you to be on our show. So then it was so weird that when we interviewed Jada and then she ended up talking about you, Michael King, you got to help me get him <laughs> because I already sent a message and somebody responded and said, okay, we're going to work on it. But I never heard back from them. So then she, I guess, God just wanted you to be on here because it was just a blessing that she came and she was able to get us connected. Well, I'm glad. I mean, I'm always grateful that people are interested in the work that I do. Mm-hmm. But that's, that to me is a blessing more than anything. So a lot has gone on in the last uh, 24 to 36, 24 to 36 months. A lot has happened. Um, my mother passed away December of 2018. Right. I was sitting right by her bedside and watched her take her last breath. She she did, um, she, she was breathing. She did four, she took, she took four different breaths. Mm-hmm. And that was the last end of it. And while something was dying in her, something was also being rebirthed in me. Mm-hmm. So I took that. She left a lot of gold and nuggets with my brother and myself. There were four of us. And then uh, about five months after that, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Right, I saw that. And that was like it was it was the it was a, just a, it was like an out of body experience. And then after that. About seven months after that, uh, the COVID hit. Mm. And when COVID hit, um, the institution was literally financially completely almost bankrupt. Well, I was amazing. And one of the um, the CPA and the auditor was telling me just recently that if you look at the basic principles of financing and accounting, the reality is that you probably should have already closed the doors then. But now it's two two years later, it's completely different. And so what I tell people, they said, what make the difference? I said, well, you really have to be spiritually grounded. Exactly. And you have to really believe in the work that you do. And so I had to, and I tell people all the time, I had a therapist. And uh, when I got a therapist, she, she wasn't doing stuff that much. So I said, you need to help me to examine my head. And I was sitting, this was in March of, what was called, 2020, mm-hmm. 2019, 20, yeah, 2020, he was in March, and we had got, everybody had gone home because they were closing everything down with the COVID. <clears throat> and so I was sitting in a chair, and in the middle of the day, I just started weeping. And so I said, why are you weeping? You know, why are you crying? And I started feeling sorry for myself because I had done so much for so many people over the years and then I said, here it is that I'm financially uh, uh, broke in terms of the institution. And then also in terms of me personally, you know, I wasn't raised, I was raised, I was, I'm not, wasn't raised poor. It wasn't raised rich, but with a family who were high achievers. And there were people who were, you know, so I wasn't used to, to that kind of a life. And so when that happened, then I called the therapist up and so, she said a lot to me, but there are two things that she said to me that really uh, stick with me now. She said, people will treat you the way you allow them to treat you. 
Okay. And then I said, I have to tr- teach people how to treat me, one. The second thing was, forget about those things in your past. Stay in your present and move toward the vision that God has for your future. Now, those are two things she said to me. And so then she gave me an exercise to do. She said, what I want you to do is I want you to write down all of those things, uh, you know, all of those pe- those people in your life that you need to distance yourself from. And when you distance yourself from those people, don't feel guilty by allowing them to be where they are. And don't think that you're in the better than they are. You just, you're, it's time for you to move on past them. Mm-hmm. And so I said, okay. And then the second thing was, she said, put together everything uh, that you want to see happen for you from this point moving forward. And then I had another session. And when I had this, the other session with her, and I gave her all of these things with people. So it was, there were people who were, I'm not going to say negative. They were people who were not a part of my circle. And so as a result of what came with that, uh, insecurity, uh, guilt, all those things come with all of that. And so then I had to work through all of those situations in order for me to be able to get to the point. And then I just said, okay. And I just went down the list. I just started exiting people out, exiting people out. I was important to them in their life. They were also important to me in my life, but they were no longer part of where I am and where I need to go. All right. And everything completely just different. It was like Paul on Damascus Road. When the lights were, were shining on him, he saw that new life and everything has been completely different. Is is it? Everything changed. Where I moved, had been living for 16 years, people said they're going to tear the, the complex down at the move. Uh, the thing with, uh, and I won't say name, but the, I was worshiping with a particular church. Uh, that changed, you know, and that was very... Uh, How difficult what, was it to take her advice and change everything like that? Because change is not easy. It wasn't difficult at all. It was it was imminent that was going to happen. I just needed somebody to confirm what you and mean? reaffirm what I already knew because God had already given to me. Mm-hmm. And so once I once I did that, I said, it's my life is absolutely unbelievable. Uh I've directed <clears throat> this season, eight shows when our forty fifth season. And I said, What's wrong with you? You must be out of your mind to be directed eight shows. But I just finished the last, the seventh show, uh, week before last, called The Death of Jesus with five mega churches. Before you get into that, yeah. let's go back. We like to take it back yeah, to... Yeah, we want to go back to Mississippi. We want, yeah, we want to know what was it like growing up in Coldwater, Mississippi. People, because not everybody know who Curtis King is, Mr. Right. Curtis King is, and what, and what made you become who you are today. Because it's always things that we go through to build character. Well, I am from Mississippi. Uh, Coldwater, right? A little town called Coldwater, which I just left. And... I mean, it was a colored high school. <clears throat> uh, and back in the 50s, it, it, it was like different. 60s. 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 70s. Yeah. Okay. But I graduated. Then I left the Cold Water High School, colored high school, and then went to Jackson State Undergraduate School. Uh, the famous Margaret Walker was my professor, and people don't know her. You should Google Margaret Walker. Mm-hmm. She had written 10 books, Jubilee and For My People, two of her most famous works. I mean, they're incredible. Was it very racist out there? A little more racist than Texas or New York or California or anywhere. It's racist in your country. <laughs> you know, I mean... It's more prejudice. Yeah, you know, well, prejudice and racist to me about they Like, they they may not be identical to me, but they, what you call, paternal twins. Mm-hmm. they twins. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this, one thing about people growing up in the deep south in Mississippi, like in Coldwater, uh, people talk about integration, but we live on this side of the street and directly across the street from us, white people live there. Mm. But you want to talk about integrated communities. I grew up in an integrated community, if you want to put it in that context. They didn't cross the street to come in our yard. We didn't cross the street to go into their yard. You know, it mm-hmm. was very respectful. Okay. Um, you know, they didn't have but three grocery stores in cold water. 
But everybody went in the same grocery store. Nobody went in the back door. You know, because again, you know, people from the South and Mississippi in particular, these people are resilient people. Mm -hmm. You know, my father was in Memphis in 1968 when, um, when Martin Luther King was assassinated and he couldn't get out of Memphis. Uh, but people, pe people fought for what they believed. And so when people in other parts of the country, whether they're from New York or the East or the West, start talking about the Deep South, if it wasn't for the Deep South, they would not have be enjoying the pleasure and the luxuries of the things that they have. They just would not be. So, I mean, all that, all that baloney about the South being this, the South being that, ain't nobody trying to hear that. Because mm -hmm. how are you going to say what a place is if you've never been there? You know? Uh, so that's a different. I love that part of it. Yeah. I, I definitely well, it be, absolutely let it be, you guys. I mean, every time I look the air, they some of history is something else down there. I, I, I always stop. I'm going to leave my wife driving. It was a bit progressive. Yeah. You know, the old Deep South. Texas is not Deep South. Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, uh, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Those are what you call the deep and south states. Okay. And so, you know, Texas is not deep south. You know, North Carolina is deep south, you know, North and South Carolina. But the history is a little bit different because they were so close to um, uh, Carolina. They were people close to with Washington, D.C. And so when people migrated, from various parts in the deep south, like in in Mississippi, depending on what part of Mississippi you lived in, if you were in the northern part of Mississippi, which is where we live, people migrated on that part of Mississippi, Tennessee, and Arkansas. They went straight to Chicago when they went west. You know, uh, then people who lived in the southern part of Mississippi, most of those people came straight across. They went to Texas. They didn't stop in Texas. They went straight to California. So they went as far west as they could, because they would deal with certain kind of uh, certain kind of issues. But <clears throat> the South is amazing. The South is absolutely amazing. so. Growing up, but then um, when you left high school, did you always know you wanted to be in the arts? Yes, I don't know. If we understood it like being in the arts. I started off as an actor mm -hmm. in high school. They were they had competitions, so we did five major productions that year. And of the five productions, I started in four of them. And then I... But your I got, father wasn't in acting. And your, no, mother, your mother was a school teacher, My mother right? was a teacher. She taught right. for 41 years. But we had pianos in the house. Okay. People in the Deep South, you were always exposed to some cultural something. Mm -hmm. You know, you had pianos in your house. Everybody on camp, you're male or female, you had to take a piano lesson. You could take a voice lesson. Or you're going to be in the band. Uh, then it's not so much unless you we're going to be a major or something like that. But being a part of the arts, as we know it, you know, I don't think they, I, I don't think they called it that. But it's, it was some culture of you were going to be a part of, you know, men had their, their nails done, their feet, uh, they did their feet. I'm not saying they went to a man and <laughs> or pensions, but your feet had to be done because we were taught that uh, and guys had to take home economics. Mm -hmm. uh, girls were, were part of the 4-H club, you know, so... What's the 4-H club? 4-H club was a, a a group of older women, older women who taught young girls how to crochet, how to make quilts, okay. and things like that. Very polished. And so when we took a take, when we had to take on making numbers, they always said that you have to always be married, but you need to learn how to sew, you need to learn how to iron. You need to learn how to cook. You need to learn how to clean. Well, there were four boys in our family. So we all knew how to do all No that. girls. No girls. Wow. My mother was, there were five on her side of the family, but she was the only girl and she was in the middle. But all of her brothers could cook. They could clean up. They could sew. They could do all those things. Now your mom and dad was together. Oh, yeah. My mother, they separated uh, when I was in grad school. Oh, okay. Yeah, but my father was very much a part of our life, mm -hmm. you know. Even if people then, if the women, the women at that time, they were going through a progressive change. Uh, black women, they, they, I don't care how difficult the situation was with your husband, you just didn't leave. Didn't leave. And so, but I think my mother, they were part of that transitional uh, generation of women who were teachers and some doctors and things like that, you know. That wanted more independence. 
they wanted more, I'm not going to say independence. They wanted more respect from the husbands because they really did believe that a husband, a wife, should have some sense of dependence and independence with the husband, mm -hmm. you know. And so some people managed to escape some of that. It's, it's really fascinating. And then after my mother's generation, then the generation after that, women started uh, taking on the values of people who didn't look like them. Mm -hmm. So so you growing up in that transitional um, era where you're seeing that, how did that affect you growing up as a man um, dealing with women? Well, you know, let me say this. Because I always respected women, you know, my mother was my mother was a woman. My grandmother was a woman. You know, I didn't have sisters, but I had women in my life who were women. You know, they were ladies. They were powerful. They were strong. And so you open the door for them. Uh, or you stand to the side. There were certain things that you did. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the which I believe in now. Because when I'm teaching kids in our summer program, things like that, there are certain things I tell them. You know, first of all, women want to be independent. You know, I said, well, no, you don't really want to be independent. Well, yes, I do. Okay, good. I'm going to get out this car. Open the door for me. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm a lady. Show me the door. Exactly. You know, so I believe that, uh, and black women in particular, mm -hmm. you know, they're strong, they're beautiful, they are smart, they are articulate. Uh, and black women, I, I really believe they really do love black men. I don't, I'm not sure that, I'm not saying that black men are insecure. And then maybe some of them are insecure because they're afraid of independent, smart thinking women. But women need to also understand that there are black men like me who are smart, independent, and can think on my feet. This doesn't mean I should be, uh, uh, what's the word, that I should be, uh, a male chauvinist mm. or egotistic or things like that. Then I have nothing to do with any of that. And so I think that men and women, people who look like us, can walk in tandem with each other and really have a very good relationship. Mm -hmm. I, that, that, I, I I feel that. Yeah. Even though I don't have any kids, I'm not married, but that's what I believe. Have you ever been married? No, never met. Don't have any kids. I got a whole bunch of nieces and nephews, and people say I have kids. You know, I was at home this past week in Mississippi with my niece and nephews, and I, they called me Uncle Curtis, all this, my brother passed away. And so I thought, I said, what would it have been like to have had, you know, three or four kids? So I tell people like Jada and all of them, well, you got kids, I said, no, I don't have a kid. You, you do, where are your kids, mm -hmm. you know? So I've learned that, you know, Erica, you know, and Erica's sister, and I have three goddaughters, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Jennifer, uh, and our husband Jennifer's a wonderful singer, but and her husband is music director for Babyface. She's uh uh in the the big choir with Kanye West. They have two beautiful daughters. Then I have another daughter. Those Jennifer's last little Jennifer Chris. Okay. Yeah. Then I have another goddaughter who's a filmmaker. Her name is Chan uh Channing Godfrey People. If you Google her, she's doing amazing stuff. Uh, her uh film was in just got some big award. And then I have another goddaughter. Her name is uh, Michelle, tall, beautiful girl, model. They they all doing something in the arts, and so I hear from them all the time. You have a lot of famous people that's been through. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna ask you something. Did you ever want to have kids? Uh, yes, absolutely so. Yeah, because I always wondered what would my kids have been like, you know? Because I ask the kids all the time, and so uh, they'll say, probably smart, you know, very creative. Very artistic, um, you know, uh, probably highly opinionated, um, but just it just didn't happen. You know, that would meet the right person. Uh, yeah, one girl one time, I thought it was in grass, but I thought she was pregnant. They actually, never told that story. Well, <laughs> well, what, well, what, well, what happened though? You say it just, it, you know the, the cause just not there. Everybody, I mean, you do have a child out there, and she just didn't tell you. Mm. <laughs> and if, if, if that had been the case, I would be highly pissed off. Mm -hmm. you know, I, bet. Yeah. I would be very upset. I would be very upset to know that I have a child and somebody would keep that from me. Right. But yeah. it just let my oldest brother, he didn't have children. What? Yeah. How was your relationship with your father, you and your father? My father, my relationship with my father was 
unbelievable. Uh, my my father was no nonsense. What type of guy? Yeah, my dad. Oh yeah, no nonsense from the deep Did south. Play with you? No, not like that. that. No, no, I didn't no, play no, no. never. And like, that didn't bother me because he didn't. Uh, Did he tell you he loved you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, it took a, it took a minute to yeah. get that. I had to because, force that out of the kind of hug him and stuff after I got old, saved and older. Yeah, because his dad didn't do that. So right, I've never. Well, started. I don't think I don't think that uh, black men who grew up during that time period, because they were busy trying to provide for the family. Yeah, and my father used to always say, if my, if your mama did it for you, that means that I did it too. That's true. That's true. But, and my mother used to always say to him, but you should call him sometime. He used to say, well, they don't call me, but call them sometime. Right. But then what, I know this are two things I learned in my life. A person can change their behavior, but you should not ask a person to change their personality. My father's personality wasn't like that. He had to alter his behavior as we got uh, adults and got older and things like that. Uh, I was my my father. Uh, my father told me before he died, I wasn't there. My brother who passed away was there. And he said, uh, "You boys stick together and take care of your mom," you know. And he always said, "If a, if your brother asks you to loan you some money, don't expect him to pay it back because if he could, he wouldn't ask you to loan it to him." So we never loaned each other money, which is gifted each other with money which is a good thing yeah and then the other thing too is that uh my on my father's side we would see there were 10 of them of uh, four boys five boys and five girls and all the boys were married but three of them ended up four that ended up divorcing wow. hmm. they know they just it just the men on let's see me the men on my on my father's side of the family just somehow just I think primarily because of the thing you're talking about. They were so strong. Hardcore. Yeah. You do this, do that. But my mother was formally educated. So she was in a generation that she was independent. Mm -hmm. But she was also independent <clears throat> in terms of her love for my father. She loved my father until the day he died. Oh, yeah. We loved him. Yeah. So how did it affect you when your oldest brother passed away? And why, how did he pass? Uh, he had a... a Blood, blood pop in his leg, and it rushed it hard and it killed it. He was like his forties. Wow, he that's young. Oh, it was very hot when you heard about it. How did it affect? It was a kind of like a, um, like something that had been taken out inside of me. Yeah, you know, and he was one of the kind of kids who kind of hit the streets. You know, because uh, I didn't, we didn't even see him uh, when my father died. Just six months when my father died. Really? And when he surfaced, he was looking for my father, and we had buried him six months uh, before. So he dared, he was different. He was different, and it. I think that was another thing uh, that he had to deal with. Uh, and broke his heart. Yeah, yeah, for a minute of time, because he didn't stay in communication with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, hey, he was, he was my brother. He was good people. They all good people. You know? Yeah, yeah. How did they feel about you and? Uh, just were all of them educated, or were you one that stuck it? No, um, my youngest brother was uh, that I just left has an earned doctorate. Okay, uh, he has two masters. He has a masters from SMU and a masters from the uh, the War College. Okay, you know he's a chaplain in the Navy for thirty years. He's traveled all over the world uh, as a top uh, a Navy officer. Things like that. He's He's, he's, he's the real deal, too. Yeah. He loves what he does as much as I love what I do. When you when you got out of school uh, after you graduated college and you started to pursue your career, what were your intentions? Uh, the, 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 what I was going to do, because I, yeah. I backtracked, you know, the actor, is go with the undergrad school to be an actor. Yeah, okay. But I started, uh, as time passed, this woman named Tommy Harris, she was a she's a fantastic actress. She still did it. She was Sam Jackson's wife in A Time to Kill. No, okay, yeah. in, in A Time to Kill, she acted this. Yeah, she plays the wife. So you've seen her in a lot of stuff. Yeah. And Margaret Walker, uh, you know, she was she was incredible. But at the school, I was going to be this actor. But then I just liked directing. Somehow, I just my mother said you like directing because you like the boss. Exactly. <laughs> right. 
But I started, I started directing more stuff. I started assisting, uh, serve as assistant director <clears throat> at the University of Jackson State University. And then I just went on. So I had a fellowship offer to University of Iowa, which is where Margaret Walker got a PhD, a uh, fellowship offer to the University of California, Santa Barbara, which is where Tommy, uh, Tamia, Tommy Tamia got her master's. I had a fellowship offer to Texas Southern University, Texas Christian University, which is how I ended up in Texas. Hey, hey, hey and then know, come on now. You went to Texas Christian? No, I didn't. I just happened you went to, you Texas, made to Texas. Texas. Right. I'm a Texas hardcore person. Yeah, so. all about Texas. Yeah, so I'm just happy you got here. Let's go. Yeah, and then I had a, a fellowship offer to Idaho State University, but I took the fellowship to Texas TCU mm -hmm. because that was the first they offered to me. Then after I took it, maybe after uh, two or three weeks later, I got a fellowship to all the rest of the college universities. And so it was like, okay, okay, what well, I'm here. So I guess I must have supposed to have been here. That's how I ended up in Texas. Man, so yeah. when did the, when, I, I, I don't want to skip anything before I get to how you developed yeah. your school. No, um, so when did the creative, how did you, we can jump into it. How did you get the idea to start um, TBAL? Well, Marvin Walker, again, took me to a conference in Chicago called the Conference to Assess the State of Black Arts and Letters in the United States. Okay. Right. I was a sophomore. No, yeah, I was leaving my freshman year, going my sophomore year. I'd never been on a plane before. But she took three students. Gene Young got his PhD from Brandeis. Emma Jean Brown, I never forget her, mm -hmm. got a M M A from... Um, she went to uh, Northwestern. Okay. And then I came to TCU. But we all went to that conference in Chicago. It was sponsored by Johnson Publishing Company and the University of Chicago School for Continuing Education. And everybody that you can possibly think of, they were at that conference. Mm -hmm. So you had Ossie Davis, Ruby D, Della Reeds, Maya Angelou, uh, John Oliver Killens, Sidney Poitier, Bella Fonte, wow. Romeo Bearden, Jacob Lawrence, uh, Mari Evans, everybody, San, Sonny Sanchez, everybody in visual, literary, performing, and cinematic arts, they were there. Were you able to talk to any of these? Oh, yeah. Can you talk to her? Talk to her just like I'm talking to you. Wow. And Margaret Walker was the keynote for the, wow. for, for the conference. And while all the rest of the kids were walking around getting uh, autographs, I was getting everybody's address and phone numbers. And I still had And they were book. willing to give you oh, that? Yeah, they give because I was a student of Margaret Walker. Oh. And I walk up to them and say, oh, I'm Curtis King from Jackson State uh, University, and I'm a student of Margaret, Margaret Walker. I said, Dr. Alexander. So Margaret Walker Alexander. Oh, yeah. You know, you Margaret student? Yeah, and I, the, the, I'm getting this, this black kid from the South. Right. And, and that's smart that you also that information. Everybody gave me their numbers. That was so smart. And I kept those numbers with me. And then I found out, as I got back to Jackson State, I wrote every last one of those people a handwritten note oh, and so thanked them for allowing me to have a conversation right. and stuff with them. And that made you stood out from everybody else just because Yeah, because I took that with me. Right. And then uh, that's how... It, but it, Before so, you go forward to that, mm -hmm. tell me a story of one of those individuals that, in the discussion that you were talking to them, they told you something that stuck with you that you always remembered. The I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, jewels or treasures, you know, because again, I was it was so many people there. Okay, and I was so awed because all of these people there were at the conference are people that I already studied, mm -hmm. and you were Jackson State. Margaret Walker was over the Black Studies program. So being of the Black Studies program, and we had all I had already written a paper about Jubilee okay. in my high school with my high school teacher, Wilma Jean Moore. And when I got on the campus of Jackson State and realized that um, Margaret Walker was on Jackson State campus, I was completely like, oh my God, I can't believe this. So as a result of that, all those things made all the difference in the world when I got those addresses and phone number and went back to the South and things like that. Mm. That was really the the starting, uh, it was the, uh, what's the word? It was, it's really marketing. Yeah, that was the thing that really, I didn't see it like that. Yeah. I just saw it as, oh my God, I can't believe, I mean, 
president of all these, these, but these people, how many are that you even they, got their information? Yeah, that's the These problem. are big names. Right. These, no, no these, are big, these are world Hillary? renowned names. Oh my talking God. to them just like I'm talking to you. And mm -hmm. so then when I got to TCU and Ozzy David Rubidy came and did, uh, it was a program or something. And I realized, I asked him about the Black Academy, because I wanted to be a member of the Black Academy. Mm -hmm. And they told me it was no longer in existence. And this was a tragedy part of it. And so I said, what happened? They said, we'll tell you later. And I never got a chance to talk to them. So when I graduated, got out of grad school at TCU, uh, I did this conference at uh, with the Sojourner the Truth career of the theater. Mm -hmm. And I found out that the Black Academy, all of the files, the records, and the minutes of that uh, organization had been thrown in a New York dumpster. Wow. And a guy, a guy named Joe Nash from the Black Dance Documentation Program brought me to this festival that I put together in 1976 in Fort Worth with the Sir John of Truth Community Theater. And in that box, there was a letter from Lake City Hughes and all of the original files and minutes in that box was from the Black Academy they gave me. And I traveled all the way from uh, Texas to um, uh, North Carolina because I worked at Shaw University for you in that theater program and took that with me. And Dr. C. Eric Lincoln, who was the uh, president, founding president of the Black Academy, he was there at Duke University. And so what I did is scheduled me to talk with him and he gave me all the history. And this was interesting. So probably... 20 some years later, I had already created the, I started the Black Academy on my data room table with $250. It was called the Junior Black Academy. But what they did, really before all of them had passed away, they said, uh, what we're going to do is have a meeting and say, you sh we should take, you should take Junior off of the Junior Black Academy. Right. And just be the Black Academy. And you did that because there was already a Black Academy. And uh, all well, no, it have ended. It ended. I did it because they said, you're doing exactly what the Black right. Academy set out to do. So just take Junior off of it and become the Black Academy. Right. And so that's what happened. That's why we became the Black Academy. Like that wow. story, man. Wow, that's great. Um, we had everything lined up. That yeah. was so great. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about uh, Erica Badu. I've been trying. That's my girl. I've been trying to get her ever since I started this podcast. Yeah, shout out. Let me shop. Do a shout out. I do every time. Shout out to Eric Badu. Uh, this is Boss Talk World One. We do it. Uh, we 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 want you here. We love. You. So, but not now we get back. All right. Now, what, how was it when you first uh, met Erica? And, and uh, how old was she? And how old was she? Erica. Erica. When I first, well, Erica's mother, Colleen, and her godmother, Gwen. Uh, well, I met Gwen before I met Colleen. Gwen Hargrove was director of the Martin Luther King Recreation Center. Mm -hmm. And I had just, I got back to Texas, I left Texas, went to New York, North Carolina, came back to Texas. And they had a uh, an artist in residence program with the Cultural Affairs, City of Dallas Cultural Affairs. And so I was an artist in residence. I was an artist in residence for the City of Dallas. And they sent you to these recreation centers to do these programs. And that's why I met Gwen Hargrove. Gwen was Erica's godmother. Mm -hmm. And so all these kids that came from South Dallas at the uh, Mother of the King Center, I started doing stuff with all these kids, you know. And so Erica was one of those, Erica and her sister, Corian, were two of the kids that were part of those, that program. And then from that, she, uh, we started, Gwen was volunteering, her mother was volunteering. They became, they were like staples of the of the institution. Mm -hmm. And so from that, Erica, her sister, and all these other kids came. But I always knew something was different about her. That's what I was going to ask. Oh, yeah. Why, how did you yeah. get yeah. Because, you know, they, the same thing that people recognize, I don't decide egotistical. I don't yeah. say if it sounds like that, it's okay. The same thing, that it thing, they call it, that other people recognize in me is exactly what I recognize in her. So I knew, I knew, cause she was in the group, and when you look at her, you know, she Erica would do little, little devilish things. They say, you know, cause she was she was growing up. She was a kid right. growing up, but whatever you, I remember we we, uh, we did this piece for women, 
And Erica did the Billy Holiday piece. She did God Bless a Child. And the way she uh, fashioned and did the reading of it, and if, if you look in her eyes, she would always go to that place. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it was in her eyes. It was her persona and things like that. And she was always the leader with the group of kids that was there. And so it was always some fascinated about her. So I'm not surprised. Erica used to take her shoes off when everybody just kept the shoes off. You know, she would always, always the earth. Time. Yeah. Oh, okay. she had her feet. She always, uh, it was instinct. And she was a teenager at that time when she came. No, she was, Erica was like seven. Oh, little. She was, she was small. Okay. They were small kids. Okay. So they were in that first tier of small kids mm. that grew up. She literally was raised and grew up in the Black Academy, mm. Junior Learning Academy. She, her sister, uh, I just go around the list of all, all those kids. All of them grew up in the, in the Black Academy. So being around big names is nothing new for Erica mm -hmm. because she, she grew up around Esther Rowe, Ruby D. Uh, Della Reese, Cicely Tyson. That's what, because these were all people that was around you. That was around me. Because you had wrote the letter. Yeah. yeah. I wrote the letter. Come on, man. <laughs> I, I, I'm right oh, now. I know right. that letter. See, that letter That's is right. something else. Oh, okay. You, it was an extraordinary move because when you were saying, okay, what did they tell you that day? It wasn't what they told him. It was the movement that he made within the whole situation yeah, yeah. that made it such a great movement. Right. And I, I was holding on to that because I know that's that's what's the foundation of Bill. You always got to have the foundation. It's that it thing you have to recognize in that. There, Jada has that it thing. Terrence has that it thing. Harper, just I just go down the list. I got about 100 kids just like this. They all got that it thing. Wow, it's in it's in it's in them, you know, and they're all doing incredible, man, when incredible they, stuff. When the J Dog came over here and saw man, that was, I still I'm gonna drop it to glue it. I keep yeah. it dropping, but yeah, uh, it's just beautiful the way a boy sounds. But Erica was was it when her her career took off? Um, what did you think about that part of it when she went into that neo soul? No, I was surprised. You know, I wasn't surprised because Erica's always been a leader. Okay. You know, but that was like a different type, was type of music. music. Yeah. Well, I think, listen to this. When everybody else was shaking their behind yeah. and showing their body right. and stuff like that. So you go all of a sudden, you go look on BET yeah. at that time. Sure, of that. And you flip in the channel and you, see you flip towel, back and you see all this. The towel so you stop and you say, oh, beautiful. what is this? So if you look at her, Aretha Franklin did that had the same kind of look. Okay. At the height of her career in the 60s and the 70s. Okay. Mm. Did she had the turban. Right. She had all the things that, and Aretha was another one of those individuals who always knew how to pivot. Yeah. You yeah. know, and she always, uh, she was an innovator. Yeah. You know, if somebody went one way, Aretha went in the opposite direction. Opposite direction. Eric is the same way. Wow. She's and the same it, way. And so when she would, when it ever it took off, she would would she always come back and visit? Oh yeah, I mean, she, I heard her say that it was such a like this. It was almost spiritual the way she spoke about the heart's Yeah, mm -hmm. Eric, Eric is the first of all. Eric is family. Yeah, you know, whenever somebody says something about Erica Badu, that's a conversation. That's not a conversation for me. It's not. <laughs> he ain't trying to hear it. I will not hear it. <laughs> I, it's not true. I will not hear it. Yeah, because I understand her sensibilities. She's incredibly smart. She's giving almost sometimes to a fault. Uh, she's she's passionate. Right. She seems she's right. understanding. If somebody is saying something negative about a situation, Eric is always going to find the positive. Mm -hmm. That's just who she is. That's you know, and she is the most given person you would ever meet. And so uh, how her uh, kids, they're the same way. They're very creative. They're very smart. Korean kids are the same way. Okay. You know, so, so. Her, yeah, her sister, they the same way. Everybody around uh, Erica, they just, she's like a magnet. You know, it just attracts that energy to her. So her mother's like that. Uh, her godmother was like that. Her grandmother, both her grandmothers were like that. You know, her daughter has got a nice voice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was listening to her down with Doug. Mm -hmm. Doug got some uh, footage of where he recorded. Oh, yeah. It is studio. Artistic. Artistic studio. Yeah. And, and he let me hear her voice. She was singing on the stage with Amanda. 
And I was like, man, she's gifted as well. She's not. Well, what do you expect? Yeah. <laughs> Look at the parents, you know. But Erica Song is the same way. Yep. Same, so, same, same March way. is the same way. Yeah. They all, all of them like that. Like I said, Corian's kids are the same way too. They're very smart. They're very talented. They're very business minded and things like that. But what else do you expect? Right. You know. Yeah, I don't fall far from the no. And Harper, uh, one of my other uh, mentees, I don't say kids anymore, one of my other mentees, she is, uh, this week she's coming back from London. She a three month program in London. Wow. Uh, R- Rachel Webb is doing well in New York. You know, Terrence Dean, I talk with him all the time. If he continues the path as an actor, he's going to be three times bigger than Denzel Washington. Wow. Mark my word. How much time do you give him to, to be like that, like in the next? I would say in the next six to seven I'm years. How old is he? Terrence is 21 now. Okay. He is he's focused. In well, that's fine. What was his last and name, Terrence? Terrence Dean. Terrence. Remember we that? Like, we're going to look at like he's, he's, he, he's, he's got that it thing. It was interesting because we were doing a show. Uh, he had not graduated then. He's in college now. And so Erica was in, came to the rehearsal that day because Puma and Lars were in the summer program. And so Eric was sitting on stage, and so I turned to her, I said, Ms. Bardo, would you like to say something? And so she talked, and then she said, uh, what's your name? And he says, Terrence Dean. She said, everybody point to him and say Terrence Dean. And everybody pointed to him and said Terrence Dean. She said, remember that name, because we're all going to remember him one day. She yeah. sighed. She, yeah. she, yeah. It's that it thing. Yeah, he got it. He's got that gift. But I got a question about um, Erica, because I heard that you're supposed to be doing a summer program for her. Well, it's not. What it is, every year for the past, probably the last 15 years, in our summer enrichment program, which is a partnership that we do with Dallas Independent School District, which is an amazing partnership. Talk about that in a minute. But <clears throat> with the partnership, every year we do an individual artist. We've done like Prince the Musical. Um, Michael the musical, Tina the musical. And this is what I believe too. Every time we've done those musicals, what do you see? Some on Broadway. Mm-hmm. You know. Right. I'm convinced that they're watching song. you. They watch what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Now you got MJ the musical. You got all his name. So this year we're doing Erica the musical. Okay. And so and it's and people say, I said, Well, how are you gonna approach it? Well, I'm not gonna say how we're gonna approach it. But, <laughs> you know, it's I don't believe it's, me. you know, it's 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 is she gonna be in there? I'm not sure if she's coming or not. You know, she has a really big dis- bit That's of right. Right. Exactly. So, But what it was important is to know that she's so internationally iconic mm-hmm. that we're able to uh, allow students, 400 some kids in the program, to study the work of, of Erica Bach. That's the good you know, That's yeah. the great thing, actually. And this, this is what I love about her, too. I was in, um, uh, in, in Rome about four years ago. So at this little shop, you know, and so I heard this on and on. So I said, that's my girl, that's Erica. And I texted her and said, I'm in uh, Rome, Italy is where I was. And, and I'm hearing so. on and on. She is major. And there are two people in Dallas that I really do love a lot. Uh, this Mark Cuban and Erica Bate. Wow. How, and, how do you love Mark Cuban? What the heck Mark Cuban got to do with this? Well, because number one is that everywhere he goes, he always talks about Dallas. Hey, I'm not going yeah. to play with you. Today. <laughs> yeah. And wait a minute. And I look at Shark Tank religiously. He does too. Yeah. I do. He does I too. love Shark Tank. Yeah. And so you don't hear a lot of big iconic people talk about a city mm-hmm. the way Erica Badu and Mark Cuban talk about the yeah. city. But yeah, those two individuals have literally helped to put Dallas on the map in a way from a marketing perspective. Right. Like other people don't do. And I would tell everybody, you know, I'm from Dallas. I'm South Dallas, just say. The sun is South Dallas. But you got an international iconic artist like her that's around the world. She's she's a planet artist. And she's gonna be real forever. People will be studying her music and her as a you know, as an artist and things like that. You know, so these are people that you just um I mean they're, they're people you just did you just know? That's why I'm like, I've only met Mark Cuban one time. Don't know him from Adam's Cat. But I will say that the Mavericks of one of the millennials just got a $20,000 sponsorship for us 
from the Mavericks to support our summer program. That's awesome. Because your program has been around for... Let me hear some Jamie Foxx. No, we've been trying to reach out to Jamie Foxx. Never have. No, not yet. Oh, Jamie, come, like, come on. Come really? on. But well, that's okay. You know what I'm saying? I'm Everybody, going in on it because he knows Terrell, Texas, you know, I can let you make it on that because I know what's going down. But uh, come on. But my thing is if everybody has his or her project that they uh, support. Right. Yeah. So if he support that, is this, if he support program with kids, which I know he does. Oh, yeah, for I'm sure. sure. I'm, I'm, I'm be some kids. Because so, everything that's supposed to be for me. Come on now. It's for me. That's what I, I always know. say. It, it yeah. ain't going to miss you. Oh, no, it no, can't no, get around no. you. It's coming straight to you. Nobody can support everything. That's right. Every right. call. Yeah, but I'm still going to mess with him because we in, we, in, we right here by Terrell. Well, we so, were yeah. trying. If you hiccup, <laughs> if you hiccup, you're going to fall into it. And he can't even really say Terrell without saying Dallas. So, right. I mean. Well, they don't know Terrell, you know. It's the same thing like with Kirk. You know, when you ask Kirk most of the time where you from, what do he say? He's yeah, in Dallas. That's Dallas. right. You know, I mean, and it's okay. Let yeah. me ask you about you, you. Do you have a relationship with Kirk? Oh, yeah. I have a relationship with Kirk. Kirk, you hear me? Give me some money. <laughs> <laughs> so, because Jada, Jada said yeah. that, that her and Kirk, you know, right, that was yeah. a godfather. Right. How was it with Jada Arnell? Like, like when you first met her, just her, because she's definitely talented, talented. I told her, I said, look here, man, you got to mix this up. I can't tell you how to do it, but you. Gospel, she should be way further R&B, than where she is right now. You can now. do whatever, man. Yeah. Well, Jada was a, a, another one of those young kids now. She's a, she's a, my mentee now. Okay. But I can't remember the name of the show. But again, I saw this little girl who was sitting on stage and kind of like, you know, oh my, the, other thing, the other thing about Jada is that we have the exact same birthday. Hey! <laughs> so if she said yin, I said yang. I said yang, she said yin. So we know each other just, I mean, just like that. Mm-hmm. But she's another one of those young uh, kids at that time. She had that it thing. You look at her, you know. Because I, I, I know him. I can point him out and say, there's something about her she has. So she's one of those people who has a, mm-hmm. she markets, you know, she knows how to market some of the stuff too. Yeah. You know, because there are days, things are very, very different. Is different. Yeah. Marketing yeah. is key and social media is yeah. everything. Right and now. how you monetize what it is that mm-hmm. you're doing. You just and, have to, you have to figure a way how to be able to do it. You, so I shared that with all of them, is how you monetize what you do. Now, the reality, let me say this. They, they'll say, oh, we, you know, Miss King, we ain't thinking about you. Well, yeah, you are. Because I already know what they do. I sit back and watch it. Right. You know, but I love her. But man. you being older and coming from a place where mm-hmm. all of that wasn't even in existence. Right, right. How well are you? Because you were trying to tell the younger kids that you need to be doing this, doing that. But you're older, so how did you Well, first of all, I, li- I listen to them. I listen to them, and I demand that they listen to me. Okay. But I also demand that I listen to them, too. You know, because I can't lift you unless I'm being lifted. So they understand what I say to them. They understand the mechanics of technology. Mm-hmm. I understand the marketing of technology. Okay. And there's a difference, too. You can have... All of these uh, followers, uh, likes, and shares all day long. If I got 20,000 followers and half of them are from South Africa, they're not coming to Dallas. That's right. That's the other thing I do. That's right. So to say to me, you have all of these followers, likes, and shares. And, then and music is a little bit different. Because I can go film. Yeah, you, know, you can download the stuff. Mm-hmm. And get, I mean, I get all of that, too. But... Uh, it just you people have to fit now, but even the even technology now, people have learned how to monetize that because what in film, <clears throat> what people are saying now is that if you can't really be able to draw people to come and see a film that you were starting and things like that, the reality is that you may or may not get the role. Mm-hmm. And some of these people who are in film and television, uh, they have to literally sign an agreement that they're gonna do so much marketing. To be able to, um, to in order for them to be able to start at least still. Let me ask you something. If you had to pick your top three, is it artists or actresses? Just artists on a whole. How how should I hit him still? Um, artists or actresses? Well, I think you should say with the hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh-huh. Just, I need do, three people. Let's do each. Okay, artists. Yes, they started. And, 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 and actors, actors. Right. So okay. let's start with artists. Um, Top three artists of all time. All time, better life, any genre. Now, you mean actors and theater? No, just artists this time, just musical artists. Musical. Right? Oh, music artists, okay. Number one. 
Well, of course, Erica's gonna be at the top of the list. That's what well, that's right. She always yeah, no guess. She did, Erica's not list. his number one. Number two, I would probably say Beyonce. Beyonce? Yes. He really he stays in Texas. Texas. That's that's no, right no, no, I mean, no, no, I love saying. Beyonce. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I just love, absolutely love Beyonce. Beyonce. Have you ever got a chance to talk with him? Never had a chance to talk to him. Man. We did Beyonce the musical last summer. And y'all did. Oh my God, it was. And we because you had to study her when you oh, started. I had to study, I had you to study, study her. her, and we had a live twenty six piece margin band. Man, let me tell you something. I'm just it was like amazing. You. I love her, Erica, and I love Beyonce. Beyonce, I've been tripping on her for years. Yeah, yeah. Little man, because she went up there with Jay Z. I'm mm-hmm. going to stay keeping Texas, right? But she done well for us. Yeah, so yeah. I got to respect the move because she didn't just go get anybody. Jay is right. a Jay is a, a, a problem when we come down to. Success. So you right. one of those guys, man. That's right. Okay, no. The third three. one would be Aretha Franklin. Man, you gotta say Aretha. Mm. Yeah. Aretha would be the well, Aretha third one. the she was something else, man. I yeah. the movie they did on and all that when they, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Man, I, I watch all that, man. Y'all, so y'all be I know y'all done musicals behind. Oh yeah, we did Aretha the musical too. Yes, definitely we did that. Okay, now we're gonna go to actors. Actors. Well, gonna give us, oh, what? Yes. She's gonna get to ask a few questions. Mm-hmm. Man, look at man, man Walker yeah. just pulled yeah. up. I would I would say yeah. actors Perfect. would definitely be uh, Sidney Poitier. Sidney mm. Poitier, yeah, that's a that, that's a good yeah, one. Yeah, I would definitely say Sidney number Poitier. Number two, uh, number two would probably be. Are you talking male and female? Male and right? female together. Well, the second one would probably be Bea Richards. What about Sister Tyson? Yeah, Miss Tyson definitely uh, a top one, but I would say Ruby D. Ruby D. Uh, Bea Richards. And Sydney Poitier. Hey man, you yeah. something else, man. Yeah. Boy, I, I got I got pulled. I ain't never had a I'm female a, that's that's just jumping in. Yeah, like but I, I need I need a whole nother list because you got people like Austin David, William Marshall, uh you got um uh Morgan Freeman, you know, and of course Denzel. But I mean I'm talking about these these older seasoned kind of actors, you know, like what was your, your favorite Erica Badu so? Your favorite of all time. The favorite one I love is is um, Orange Moon. Orange Moon. That's it, right? That's a love making song. (laughs) That's a love making song. (laughs) All right, y'all got y'all got to play that now. I'm gonna play it. You got to play that one. Oh my god, Orange Moon. (laughs) Orange Moon. And then the Green Eyes. Green Eyes. Yeah, yeah. And she's just always been different and free spirited. Yeah, I love that about her. And her stuff is is still in the pocket, but it's still very different. And Erica knows how to tell a story in a song. I went to see uh, Farrakhan over there off of... Uh, Loving. Over there off of... Uh, we was over there off of Dolphin, and I went to see Farrakhan. Mm-hmm. But I went ballistic because Erica Badu was there. Mm-hmm. That was my whole... I forgot about Farrakhan. I love him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But... Dang, I Erica here, man. But let me tell you about my relationship with the minister. Okay. Love Minister Farrakhan. I had uh, a friend of mine was uh, in D.C. She's passed away. But she was working with the United Nations. Okay. And so I put together uh, an African Caribbean big piece for our 23rd uh, season. I had 30 ambassadors, ambassadors from Africa and the Caribbean, Caribbeans and their spouses in Dallas, Texas. Wow. And when the minister did um, the Million Man March, I had called uh, him and asked him if I could put together a 1,000 voice male chorus for the Million Man March. And I stayed with the minister, myself and the woman that I'm talking about with the United Nations. And we stayed with Minister Farrakhan for a week. Wow. And I put together the whole perspective about what the Million Man March was about. And if you look at some of the video, all of these uh, African-American males mm-hmm. dressed in black started at the top of the Capitol and it came all the way down, all the way down. And they sang, sang it's like, we were rehearsed, rehearsed at uh, Walter Fontroy's church. Now, people don't know Walter Fontroy. Walter Fontroy was one of the big six for the March on Washington in the, in the 1960s. Wow. So I rehearsed that. So I'm the minister, I'm very close to Mr. Barracon and his family. He's a he's an amazing, amazing, misunderstood human being. Mm-hmm. Man, I tell you what, man. I, I heard him say something one time. Uh, he, he said, he said, Frederick Douglass said power concedes to nothing without a demand. Right. But he said power won't even concede to a demand when it looks like it's coming from a weak constituency right. that's lost its testicular fortitude. Right. Oh, my God, yeah. He heavy. 
Oh yeah. I, I, I'm telling you, I, I like it, and I know I, I study a lot. Yeah. That's that's why I was telling you last night we can we can have whatever kind of sitting you want to have. I'm that one to deal with it. Yeah. But I, I think I think that again I think that we're misunderstood. I think at the time that we exist now is none of us can afford the luxury to call each other names. Hey. Mm -hmm. You know. I don't care what color you are. I don't yeah. care what your race is. The planet is just isn't condition for us to beat and bash each other. I think if COVID didn't teach us anything else, it taught us, you know what? You're in prison. Our kids, when they went to COVID, they were in prison. prison that's right. So now we have to try to recondition these kids' minds. They have so many emotional challenges. And that's why I put together this piece called Performing Arts Matter. It's a piece with the Dallas Independent School District. And we have 15, Jada's a part of it. We have 15, wow. uh, young professionals that's going into the schools, particularly in my community, and teaching music, theater, and dance, and teaching them if you have, if you enjoy the arts, you enjoy learning. Yeah. You know, so make it fun for them to do what they do, but they're learning while they enjoy doing it and teaching our kids to be able to think Man. on their feet. Okay, Paul, but what, what did you, how's it going? It was going good. I'm excited. Okay. What, I'm what, what, I've talked a lot, right? And You're doing Mr. Great. King, what, 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 if you had a question, what would you ask him? I got three. Oh, you, what? You done wrote them down. Well, give you better it up. Hurry up. You better hurry oh, up. Yeah, yeah you're on the schedule. So you've been in a lot of projects, and you have done a lot of things. So what is like one of your favorite projects you love to know every year? Well, the project that I absolutely enjoyed doing was really the, uh, I did the piece for the 30th anniversary March on Washington at the Kennedy Center. And it was in 1993. It's by far the best. I had Dan Rather, Carol Simpson, Bertha Kitt, Halle Berry, wow. Esther Rowe, Billy Esther Preston. Rowe. I had 35 major celebrities like that. And I put together an exhibition that was at the Corcoran Gallery and did the Canada replica of the King concert. And we got five Emmys, no, four Emmys for mm -hmm. Uh Did at the Kennedy Center. And we got international press as a result of that. Man. So that's my all-time favorite piece project. The other thing would probably be uh uh I just I'm thinking about the other about some other stuff, yeah, but that's one of the favorites. It was a huge project. Yeah, question. Question. And I gotta ask this one. Do you know a man by the name of J. D. Williams? J. D. Williams, yeah, from these is in New York. Uh the J.D. Williams, wait a minute. I think he was in Dallas. Maybe I know him I see him. I can't remember it. A playwright? Uh, no, it was something personal with a fire or something like that. A fire? was J.D. Williams. Yep. J.D. Williams. So growing up, I wanted to go to your program, and my daddy was very strict. But he would not let me go until he figured out it was you because he said that uh, you and his great -gra my great-grandfather had a uh, close relation. Who's your great? Who was he? J.D. Williams. J.D. Williams. So maybe like, look, you have a picture of him? No, I don't. Wait, 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 give me a picture of him. So I, I, can, I will. That was right. a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was before good. you was born. Mm -hmm. Way before you was wow. born. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, but that, that's that's nice, man, that, that, that you know, you, you touch lives and you don't even know it sometimes. Right. Yeah, no, I don't. But <laughs> I mean, I would hope that I am doing it. Oh, you're doing it. Yeah. That's and your next my question. My last question is, if you could, if you was to leave tomorrow, what is one thing you would want the world to remember you by? Um, that's a, that's a good question. A really good question. Uh, I'm I'm gonna quote Cicely Tyson. Okay, I'm mm there. -hmm. I done my best, mm -hmm. man. That's what she said when Gail King asked her, you know, how would you want to be remembered? She she dropped her head and she raised her head up and she said, I done my best. And that's what I would say that after the great sister Tyson, because I was very close to Miss Tyson, mm -hmm. you know, you know, I, I, I'm going to put a pair of this kind of jump on something you're saying. The other piece would be the piece that I did with Ruby D at the Apollo Theater. Okay. It was called an Even a Music and Spoken Word with Ruby D. And we did it in Dallas, but Miss D wanted to do something at the Apollo Theater because she said she had not been at the Apollo Theater since <clears throat> the 1950s. And we did it. I bought a four-piece band from Dallas and three-piece background singers, three amazing background singers. Um, and we rehearsed in Ruby D's house, Ruby D and Ossie Davis' home, 
We did it at Apollo Theater. It was a Mother's Day weekend. People standing around the block to get in. And this was the greatest joy I had. It is at the end of the show, Miss Tyson waited on me. She says, put something together like this for me. I said, oh, I'd love to do that. But I took Sister Tyson, held my left hand on, and I escorted her to the dressing room for her to see Ruby D. And I, st- I stood there for maybe, maybe five minutes and watched Ruby D and Sister Tyson have a conversation. And that, to me, was amazing. So that would be the other piece would be a thing that sticks in my memory like that. I think another thing, too, I'm t- right quick, is the, to direct uh, Esther Rowe in Bethune that's based upon Mary McLeod Bethune's piece. You know, she, Esther Rowe was incredible. She was another incredible actress, too. But to, to have the, the wherewithal to direct her in that show was amazing. And in 1986, I remember this. I directed Esther Rowe in The Amen Corner. Juanita Moore, who you don't know, I know, who starred in Imitation of Life. Life. She played, played Lina Turner's uh, The Maid in that, but she was nominated for an Oscar for that in 1959. Mm-hmm. And then Helen Martin, who was the woman who played Pearl in 227. I directed all of them, and Al Popwell, who played all the Dirty Harry movies, at the Dallas Theater Center in 1986. We did 16 shows, and then we were trying to get additional stuff, and we couldn't try to get additional uh, space to do the show, but we couldn't get the additional shows to do that, and so we ended up not doing it. That I have some really memorable stuff to do that. I mean, that was when I think about that and all of this. It was it was absolutely amazing. So, the A Man Corner directing them, the uh, Ruby D uh, at the Apollo Theater. The March on Washington piece. Those are some pieces that I that I do. I'm just just I'm awed at this point in my life to have had the opportunity to really have worked with so many great people. And then Romare Bearden. I stayed with Romare Bearden, who's a very famous visual artist, with he and his wife and Annette at uh I want to say nine twenty five Canal Street in New York. I may have the dress well. But with them Canal Street. Google Romare, R-O-M-A-R-E, Bearden, you know, just amazing. All of these people, people that I've stayed with, Elizabeth Catlin, very famous uh, artist. Uh, she was one of the 25 women that uh, that uh, that uh, Oprah Winfrey honored as a part of the Legends Ball uh, that did her. I was also, I'm also uh, feel good to put a piece together with Della Reese you know, in, in California. And she said, we have it all on tape, that she had never been given an individual honor in her career. She's always been, had always been honored and given tributes to with other artists, but never by herself. It was, it was amazing. So I feel, I feel good. I mean, in Beer Riches, I studied on the Beer Riches called the Theater of Being in California. You know, Beer Riches was uh, a great actor. She plays Sidney Poitier's mother in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Just an incredible actress. Let me ask you this. You've been you've done so much. Is there anything left that you haven't accomplished that you want to accomplish? Yeah, I want to do a film. Okay. I'm really interested in doing a feature film. I have a show called Blues Bar okay. that I did in nineteen ninety four. Billy Preston, Phyllis Hyman, and Roger Moses started that. And I want to do a film. I've already I've already uh got the uh screenplay done, but I want to do a film. At one point we had Fantasia. Her, her manager, Brian, at the time, Dickens, had uh, gotten her to do the lead. It's about this this black girl from the South uh, with this blues uh, club that she had grown up in. So I wanted Fantasia to do that because it's a musical theater film. So really good, if I'd say so myself. Well, it's a good, good piece. So a question for my young creators. Mm-hmm. Uh, would they want to get involved in the T-ball and they want to get books from any shows. How can they go about that? They need to call me. Oh. But 214-743-2440. But I would tell them, don't come with no baloney. <laughs> okay. Come with uh, a creative mind and with a really good focus of what you really want. And think through what it is that you want. You know, I don't mind guiding and directing you to those things. But you should have an idea of what is it you want? Because this is what I tell people all the time. 
the Black Academy doesn't belong to me. Mm -hmm. I started the project. It belongs to all of us. And it's a place for us to work and try and error our work and things like that as young artists, as established artists, as artists that's not even born. So all they have to do, that, that, that institution belongs to everybody. I don't own that place. And with you supporting so many people in the community, how can the community support you? All they got to do is take out a membership. <laughs> Call 214-743-2441 and speak to our membership coordinator, <laughs> Sheila Cunningham, and take out your membership. Minimum is $20. Okay. So that's all they got to do. Mm -hmm. You know, money is what makes the world go round, right? Mm -hmm. And I will, I'm definitely a big fan of giving you giving your flowers while you're alive. I went through your program, mm -hmm. uh, DISD Partnership. Mm -hmm. The discipline, the confidence, the connections is worth it. I wound up raising my niece for a summer, and she was acting up in school. I put in your summer camp, straight up. And wow. I need parents to understand that in a world like this, we need people like you. We need direction. We need mm -hmm. discipline. And I'm so grateful that you're still giving it to I need. Yeah. But you know what I'm telling you? I know, I know you got to go. But I'm grateful to be giving it because I don't take no nonsense. Because, you know, what concerns me always is when people say that, well, you know, the kids are not doing this or they're not doing that. Whatever a child is not doing is because you've not taught them, mm -hmm. you know. So you're going to blame a kid for not doing something or behaving a certain way. I mean, you're not, you've not given them what they need or armed them with all of the things that they need in order to be able to get to where they're going. Kids don't just grow themselves. They have to be shaped and formed and molded and directed. So the reality is that I don't play with them. <laughs> I play with them. That makes sense. Uh, and so, and, and I love them. You know, and what they, kids know nowadays, they know when you really love them and you're concerned about them. That's why I put together a young millennial board. The young man who's chair of the board is Ruben Lael. He's a wonderful singer, somebody you should put on your, on your, uh, your podcast too. He's amazing. He's smart. He's talented. He can sing. He's articulate. Uh, and he's aggressive and a go-getter. And it's a millennial board of nine. Uh, and they really are doing some amazing stuff. And so what I do is I listen to them. I share information to them. I, they share information with me. Like one of the millennial board members, Jillian uh, Jones Mitchell, she's got married. But she got us a $10,000 sponsorship. And I told you the other gentleman got us a twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars ship. And they're the, and the rest of them, they're raising money, you know. And they bring people, they get people to rent the venue. But they're between twenty six and thirty five. Mm -hmm. Yelling. Unbelievable. They are smart, they are articulate, they are focused, they are no nonsense. They love the Black Academy and they love me. Man. They love me because I love them. Black Academy, man. So did you ever, and I'm done, it's the last question. He got to get out. Yes. Okay. The Black Academy, did you ever hit a hiccup where you felt like you was going to have to close it down? Yeah, well, yeah that's well, during the COVID. Early. During He's the like early. So that, that, that was the only time. No, no that wasn't the only time. The, that, 1981, was... 1981 was another major pitfall uh, when we lost a building over on Peak Street. And that was really the demise. But Esther Roll and Bea Riches, and a, a Jewish man named Leon Rabin and Ed Strauss, a Jewish woman who was became the mayor, uh, Kathleen Gilliam and uh, Yvonne Yu, I said, and the commissioner, John Wiley Price. Hey, and come on now. Diane That's, I'm trying to get him on this show. Uh, all of them made all the difference in encouraging me to keep going what you're doing. All of them. Thank you so, so much. So Diane Ransdale, John Wiley Price, they steal around, and you should definitely get them. I'm telling you, definitely. Yeah, will. both of them. Yeah, yeah. But they're doing amazing stuff. You got something else? Here she comes. One last. Thing. Oh man! <laughs> Since you have no kids, um, who will you pass this business on to? This legacy on to? Well, even even if I I do have kids, even if I had biological kids, I wouldn't say I would pass it on to them. They might not be interested in it. That's true. But the Millennia Board, that's the group of young minds. Yeah that I'm giving them all the information, the politics, the money, mm -hmm. the artistic integrity, the quality, the standard, the level. You can't come to the Black Academy, put your uh, foot on the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, when you walk in that building, you better come straight and come right. It looks great. 
is organized, is thorough, and I would not demand, I would not accept anything any less than excellence. You know, excellence is my thing. That's what I tell the kids in the summer program. What's your, what's our motto? Excellence is my thing. This is the institution motto right now. Um, image is everything. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell them. The people who clean the building, I say, you're not cleaning people. You're image builders. That's who you are. Yeah. And so, hey, I'm down. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Mr. King. We love you. And we definitely appreciate you for taking time out to come on Boss Talk 101, where the boss is talking. Well, I can do, I really didn't have much of a choice. Because <laughs> when Jada Arnell picked the phone up and said, uh, excuse me, you need to do this. That's how they treat me. <laughs> she didn't ask me. She just said, you need to do this. I said, okay. Shout out to Jada, so we love you. Did you enjoy it? I need you to call Erica and be like, you need to do this. Hey. Hey. I, I, will, I, I would call Erica and... Put it on the line. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe something, you know... But wherever she is, maybe you can find another way to do it. Yeah, just like that. You know? We'll fly out to her. We'll yeah. come. Yeah, we fly out to her. Thank you so much, man. We no, love thank you. you. Curtis, man. Hey, man, Mr. King, we love you, brother. You done blessed this platform today. You gave us things, jewels. Jewels. At the end of the day, a lot of people going to see this and they going to say, hey, man, I didn't know that. Dang, I didn't know this. Yeah. And that's what this show is about, educating everybody and showing them, man, mm -hmm. that, hey, man, you can look at this and understand your situation a little better. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for inviting me. Sorry, I was a little late. Man, hey, oh, my God. God. I don't want to hear Jada's mouth, and I don't want to hear your wife's mouth. Hey, that's the ones, boy. <laughs> thank you so much, man. All it's right, been another you. great segment of Boss Talk 101, where the boss is.